yeah, this, this was prepared um, for the 80th anniversary of the Australian Broadcasting Commission. It was prepared for the vintage or by the Vintage Wireless and Gramophone Club uh, and was presented as part of the centenary of the Applecross Wireless Station, which is Wireless Hill. Um, and uh, this talk was prepared to go as part of the centenary. I'd like to acknowledge the Vintage Wireless and Gramophone Club um, because if you're interested in that, that sort of thing and you need help with wirelesses and gramophones, they can help you. Also acknowledge the Friends of the ABC. Anyone here from the Friends? of the ABC because they were very helpful in uh, publicising this um, and also I'd like to draw your attention to the Museum of Early Western Australian Recorded Sound. It's a web-based museum and it has very unique Western Australian recordings, not, ma not commercial ones but unique one-off ones including the oldest known datable Western Australian recording which is 1907 uh, of a uh, cornet player recorded in Albany in 1907 and you can hear that if you get onto the web there as well as lots of other uh, rare Western Australian sound recordings and also draw your attention to the Encyclopedia of Western Australian Wirelesses and Gramophones which is due to be published in October um, as part of the centenary of Wireless Hill as well. However, you're here tonight for the story from 6WF to the ABC celebrating the centenary of the Australian Broadcasting Commission. Now this came about because of a scrapbook uh, that was kept by Wally Coxon um, uh, and it's, it's in possession of the family and when I looked through it and saw the way he had collected information in his scrapbook um, I realized there was an interesting story here and um, so I thought this is worthwhile telling so the presentation is really based upon what he collected in his scrapbook and it tells a, I think a very interesting story that's Wally Coxon yeah he, he was brilliant he just did so many innovative things um, he's got a whole chapter to himself in the encyclopedia um, and of course he was involved in, he was hired by West Australian farmers to establish 6WF and he was hired to design the mulgophones, these are mulgophones made for West Australian farmers to be sold to the farming community it's for entertainment and educational type purposes and informational purposes um, and uh, these are all, the dates are on them but these are all mid 1920s so we're going to start with radio waves. The words to do with radio waves will pop up now and again, um, things like wavelength. So I thought it was worthwhile making sure you understood what I was talking about there. For example, you know about magnets, don't you? You know, magnets will attract bits of iron, cobalt and nickel and all that sort of thing. And if you've got a magnet, um, you know, around it there's a magnetic field where it will attract the iron and cobalt and nickel uh, metals. Have you ever done this at, at home? You get the hose on the hose pipe, uh, when you're young of course, and you flip it up and down and you send waves along the hose pipe. If you get a magnet and flip it up and down very fast, then you'll send ripples out. The, the magnetic field will flap up and down. You'll send ripples out in the magnetic field. What about that experiment with electrostatic fields? You know, you get a comb and you sort of rub it and attract the hairs on your hand and bits of paper. There's an electric field around the comb as well. Same thing applies. There's an electric field. If I wobble it from side to side, the electric field flaps and you'll send ripples out in the electric field. However, if you could do both these simultaneously, uh, let's pretend this is the magnet, this is the electric field. If I could move this up and down, and at the same time move this one sideways, you'd have magnetic waves and electric waves together. You'd have electromagnetic waves. And really, that's what radio waves are. Radio waves are waves in electromagnetic field. Like, there's the magnetic wave you're sending out, and there's the blue is the electric wave you're sending out, and the two together um, are electromagnetic waves. If I do it fast, if I could make, move this up and down and this sideways, at 450 million million times per second when those ripples got to your eyes your eyes would see red you'd see red light because that's all red light is and if I did it 600 million million times per second when those ripples reach your eyes you would see green light but if I slow it down if I did it 99 million 300 thousand times per second, 99 million 300 thousand times per second, you'd produce the same radio waves that triple, you listen to triple J don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 
uh, Triple J uses. Or if I did it at 720,000 vibrations per second, then that's the radio waves that 6WF or 720ABC uses. Okay, because we're going to be referring sometimes to the wavelength. The wavelength is the length of one of these waves, and you hear the word short wave. If these ripples are between 10 and 100 meters long, we call that short wave. If uh, the ripples are between 100 and 500 meters long, then that's a medium wave. And if it's, uh, if it's uh, between, say, 500 meters and 2,000 meters, you know, a couple of kilometers, that's called long waves, and that will pop up here and there. Right, 6WF opens. In April 1924, West Australian farmers opened 6WF as a service to the farming community uh, uh, for information and entertainment, and they used the long wavelength. They used 1,250 metres wavelength in the long wave band. This is from a, 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 a Mulgaphone leaflet, an advertising leaflet um, showing a, like, a typical farming community. It's a West Australian farmers leaflet. We're picking up the radio waves with their big aerials um, and picking up 6WF in 1924-25, somewhere around there. Opening of 6WF. Right. Um, the managing director, Basil Murray, uh, opened 6WF. Um, the guests who numbered several hundred were welcomed by Mr. Basil Murray on behalf of West Australian Farmers Limited. Prior to the opening ceremony, many availed themselves of the opportunity to inspect the plant, which extended over three floors of the building. Mr. Murray explaining that the Premier would declare the station open by speaking into a receiver in the studio, and from the studio the speech and the concert would be transmitted to the aerials and reconveyed to the receivers in the conference room so that everyone could hear it and also throughout the state. But an interesting comment here from the Premier. The Premier, Mr Collier, opens it. In acknowledging Mr Harper's remarks, Mr Collier said he was very much struck with the evening's demonstration and felt that there was a wonderful future ahead for the country people through the broadcasting. He was so impressed with what, it, what at present a monopoly, that's West Australian farmers, that he thought, should the government consider a state enterprise, a broadcasting station, would be a very valuable asset and one well, well worthy of consideration. So even then, the government could see this could be something that's good to get into. That's June 1924 in the paper. Initially, radio sets like these mulgophones were supposed to be fixed to one wavelength, only um, uh, in this case 1250 metres, and you weren't allowed to listen to any other station. You paid your fee when you bought your receiver and you locked it onto one station and that was it. If you wanted to listen to another station, there wasn't any, but you'd have to buy another receiver from that company. So 6WF like had a monopoly on selling these. People hated it because you know, they, people, had, people had wirelesses long before 6WF opened. You know, they were communicating with each other and doing all sorts of experiments. Um, and they hated the idea of only listening to one station. So within two months or three months of the opening of 6WF, the sealed set system was dropped and it went to a different system. Uh, license fees were introduced. Um, you had to pay 20 shillings to 30 shillings. Many people avoided paying the license, um, you know, if you get away with it. Um, and there were letters to the editor. Sir, before using much more space on sob stuff regarding the neglect of wireless listeners, it might well uh, to explain in detail where the money goes and what it is spent on. If it is for programs, this is 1925, if it is for program, then the items issued in Western Australia are not worth paying for. Gramophones and pianola selections issued in generally unbearable fashion constitute the backbone of the problem and everything has got for nicks. In other words, you know, the, the company broadcasting just put on a piano player roll and played it over the air or put on a record. And then if, if the money or a share of it goes to amalgamated wireless, has anyone yet explained exactly what this company has done for the money got from the public and how it justifies its existence? Part of the money had to go to AWA to, because of patents and so they collected a, a section of the licence for patents there. Now, 6WF did some uh, great feats. Um, for example, 1926, uh, during the hours of 11 p.m. on Friday, the f on Friday to 4 a.m. Saturday morning, station 6WF of West Australian Farmers created a world record for broadcasting when they relayed station 2LO from London. 
Uh, what happened was 2ALO actually transmitted to the Dutch station in Holland, which then transmitted short wave and was picked up by 6WF and then was retransmitted. I suspect it was picked up by Wally Coxon at his home because he was into that sort of stuff at home and probably then sent to 6WF for transmission out to the public. So they were trying interesting things at the instigation of Wally Coxon. These are some of the amazing things he did. However, the financial situation, 1928, was not really very good. West Australian farmers were struggling. No capital specially subscribed for broadcasting purposes. Necessary funds are provided by West Australian Farmers Limited out of the general funds for that company. So, in other words, the government wasn't giving them any money. They got it from their licences. And down the bottom, look at the losses they were making. 1928, um, the losses for 1924-25 were £3,100. For 1925-26, £4,000, £4 Huge amounts of money where Australian farmers was losing. Um, so it wasn't very sort of financial at, the, at this stage. So there were possible changes coming. Wavelength, there was, move, there was talks about changing from the long wave down to the medium wave. Although nothing is known officially here, people interested in wireless who have returned from the eastern states during the last fortnight have been convinced in their own mind, from what they have heard in authoritative circles there, that the wavelength of the local station will shortly be reduced to something around 400 metres. That's in the medium wave band. There's no genuine reason why wireless should not be as popular here as in the other far-flung states and sparsely populated states um, with such organisations as uh, J.C. Williams supplying the talent. They're sort of saying, um, we hear that the wavelength is going to be changed down to medium wave. It, it should be popular here, uh, like it is in the eastern states, but it hasn't quite got there yet. So the government starts to make threats. 1928, the government says, get your act together, it will take you over. Wireless broadcasting companies throughout Australia have been notified by the Postmaster General, Mr Gibson, that definite plans for the coordination of services and a concerted arrangement for programs must be submitted to the government wireless authorities by the end of the present month, April 28. If the companies do not take the action demanded, steps will be taken by the Postal Department to ensure that the request is complied with. Um, get your act together, basically, what they're saying. Supply a program, the government acts. The government decides they've got to do something. 1928. The Commonwealth Government intends to invite offers uh, for people to supply broadcast programs for the whole of Australia. The fees from all states to be pooled to meet the cost. Uh, now the A-class stations, the A-class stations got their fees, for, uh, got their money from the licence fees. B-class stations will have the uh, freedom of the air. They can have advertisements. So the government uh, is sort of uh, saying. We're looking for someone who will supply the program. Since you're not doing a good enough job with the programs, we want someone to supply the programs to the stations. The wavelength debate begins. Problems here uh, with uh, changing the wavelength. The problem is that people uh, in Western Australia could pick up the eastern states. And the eastern state stations were on the medium wavelength. So it was pretty good. You could pick up 6WF on the long wavelength but you pick up Eastern State stations on medium wavelength, where they were. But the problem would be that if 6WF was brought from the long wave down to the medium wave, it would be so much more powerful, it would wipe out any possibility of hearing the Eastern State stations. And that's not wanted. They did, people didn't like that. Um, the question of wavelength is likely to be a much debated one. In, and in this state, we'll probably turn upon the point as to whether 6WF should not come down to, be rec to the recognised broadcasting band of 250 to 400 metres. Now, by coming down to this wavelength, we would undoubtedly be able to get secure cheap sets built on the mass production lines in the eastern states. See, at this stage, we had to have special sets for us because we're on long wave. You couldn't import a, a wireless from the eastern states for 6WF because that, that would only pick up the medium wavelength, not the long wavelength. But if, if we brought our wavelength down in Western Australia, then you could get the cheap sets coming in from the eastern states. So, um, we'd, we'd get mass produced lines, but on the other hand, if the wavelength of the local station is not sufficiently removed, different, to those of the eastern states to permit um, of moderately sharp tuning, local receivers tuning in for other stations in the band 
will be completely blanketed and the possibility of hearing a talk on growing tomatoes from 6WF scrambled with an up-to-date version of yes we have no bananas from 3LO in Victoria would make the confusion even worse. Bananas. We have no bananas today. We string beans and onions, cabbages, scallions, and all kinds of fruit and say. We have a long ration tomato, long island potato. But yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. So they could see if 6WF went to the medium wave, it would mess up their listening to the Eastern States stations as well. So a fresh start is wanted. They want a clean uh, start. Um, a conference is wanted. Let us write Finnis to the page of wireless now closing and start with a fresh sheet. Indeed, it will be best to forget the mistakes of the past unless it be that we remember them only so as long as to teach us not to repeat them and to start from the zero mark almost as though we had never had and never previously had wireless here. They really wanted a, a totally a fresh start with wireless. This is 1928. Start of the change. 6WF is sold to the Commonwealth Government. It is learned last night that 6WF wireless station Wellington Street had been sold to the Commonwealth Government by West Australian Farmers. The manager of West Australian Farmers Limited, Mr J Thompson, said that the sale was affected by telegram during the afternoon and as minor negotiations were still in progress, he did not wish to disclose the price. The transfer would not for the present involve any change in the administration of the station. The Federal Government would rent the firm's premises and there'd be no change in staff. Basically, they bought the station, but they didn't change anything. Um, it's still the same rooms that the government would rent from West Australian farmers, and it's the same technology, the same transmitters, all that sort of thing. It's just that it's now owned by the government, December 1928. Improvements. They suggest that they're going to make improvements. Like, for example, local interest was suggested. This is 1929. For the first time in Western Australia, the Commonwealth Wireless Station 6WF broadcasted the state championship swimming races from the Clement Baths. Considerable interest has been shown by the public. So they're doing something like an outside broadcast. And education, um, Commonwealth intent, education broadcasting forms an important part of the Commonwealth Government's control of broadcasting. They're going to broadcast university things as well. So they're, they're thinking of all sorts of good possibilities. But the public's not interested. And they're not buying wirelesses. There's decreased public interest. In fact, the traders, you know, like Musgroves, Battiphone, Nicholson's, there's a conference of traders in 1929. It is generally acknowledged that wireless broadcasting in this state if not also in the eastern states, is in the reverse of a flourishing condition. In the words of the chairman of the conference held in Perth yesterday, it is dead now or dying. The aim of the conference was a revival of interest in wireless. It was held in the boardroom of GPA. Okay, so the, the, the traders really think wireless is dead in Western Australia. So there's much dissatisfaction. Um, one of the problems, you remember, I mentioned the Applecross wireless station? Um, the, the, they transmit by Morse code. One of the problems is this, they, they were so powerful that they would in fact intrude on people's crystal sets because crystal sets like these weren't very selective in their tuning. They're pretty broad and so you might be listening to one station 6WF but you pick up the Applecross wireless station. We have had numerous complaints about interruption by Morse. We cannot of course entirely eliminate this so the studio orchestra will play something that fits in. So, with reference to your article on wireless broadcasting in your issue of today, to my mind, the chief obstacle to the success of broadcasting is not the service now given, but the constant interruption of the Applecross station. Oh, and also, there's only one station, and there's not enough licenses to sustain more. Wireless broadcasting in this state cannot be considered successful until you send up your license figures to from 12,000 to 20,000. It, and it is almost a sheer waste of effort and certainly a waste of good money to attempt to do anything while we only have one station here. So with one station, not enough licenses. And not enough licenses means we only got one station. 
There is resistance to this change from the long wave down to the medium wave, and listeners threaten to hand back their licenses if you do this. One sympathises with those complaining of Applecross's interference, but if increasing 6W, 6WS power on shortwave and consider, considerably reducing the 1250 metre wavelength are going to bring about the latter station in on all condenser settings over the 300 to 500 metre band, then bang goes my licence. In other words, if you come down to the, to the medium wave band, um, I'm handing my licence back. So they, people weren't happy with that possible change. Now, this is 1929, the government now calls for tenders for people to provide programs. The story is the government owns the technology, they own the station, but they, the government doesn't run the program. So now they're asking for some company or businesses to provide the programs and the government would handle the technology for the transmission. So um, they call for uh, tenders. Full details will be made available today for the conditions governing the tenders which are being invited by the Postmaster General's Department for the provision of programs to the federal government take, when the federal government takes over control of the broadcasting stations. Under government control, wireless broadcasting will be known as the National Broadcasting Service. So they're asking who, who can actually um, um, provide the programs. WA is also only allowed to have one station from September 1st, 1929. There's no possibility of any other station at this stage. Tenders accepted. Uh, what happened was the Union Theatre group, uh, there was half a dozen people tendered uh, groups, um, of the eight tenders uh, received for the provision of broadcasting programs for all states of Australia, the Federal Ministry decided today to accept that of the group comprising Union Theatres Limited, Fuller's Theatres Limited, J. Albert and Son of Sydney. The service will be known as the National Broadcasting Service. So these theatrical people got into it because they could see, you know, they've got the talent, they've got the musicians, they've got the uh, actors, so they can easily put together programs which are then given to the, the national broadcasting stations throughout Australia. Um, the contract was going to be for three years and the contractor would be paid a proportion of the licence fee. Um, so the tender was accepted. However, the government imposed conditions. Look at the conditions. You must provide 3,650 hours per year. So you've got to provide 10 hours of programming a day. It must be in the public interest. The programs must be supplied two weeks in advance to the station and to the press. The station, studios and technology will be supplied to the contractor free. Now, the government will let them use the technology free. But all technological details will be controlled by the Postmaster General and there will be no advertisements. WA is unhappy. <coughs> from the standpoint of Western Australia, the most this is from the West Australian newspaper, 1929. From the standpoint of Western Australia, the most interesting feature of the new national wireless situation is that she has been forgotten. No doubt the struggle between the Dominions Broadcasting Company, which hitherto had been predominant in Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, and the new Australian Broadcasting Company, which has won the national contract, has been absorbing and possibly will continue in the High Court. So, you know, there's... Um, the, the WA needs a relay station to for the country. People are too far away. We need a relay station down the country. We need to change the medium wave. We need an alternative station, alternative station in the city. We need cheaper sets, um, imported probably from the east. So you know, WA needed all these sorts of things. There's need for improvement. West Australian 1929. The statement that the Australian Broadcasting Company would provide programs for all states and that the Postal Department would see that a high standard was maintained means little or nothing to listeners in Western Australia unless there is at least one additional station established. A high standard of programs will not lift the fallen reputation of broadcasting in this state. The company that won the tender calls itself now the Australian Broadcasting Company and they said they'd carry on even if they, um, they do make a, a, a loss out of it. The situation in 1929, you can see why things are not good in WA. Look at the percentage of population who have a licence. Like in Victoria, 8% have a licence. In Western Australia, 0.96% have a licence. 
If the new broadcasting station owners are to have any increase in licenses, they will first have to convince the public of the possibility of a cheap, foolproof facility for receiving the program. We don't want ones like this. These are too complicated. We want a cheap, foolproof radio for it to work. That's what's wanted. Otherwise, it's not going to work here. From September the 1st, 1929, the wavelength changes down to 435 metres. Just as a matter of interest, today 720 ABC is on 416 metres. The Postmaster General today said that certain alterations, including a change of wavelength to 435 metres, 690 kilocycles, will be made in connection with the West, West Australian Broadcasting Station 6WF. The change will operate from September the 1st, when the Australian Broadcasting Company will begin its service in Perth. So the, the frequency changes. All of these sets, some of them will work, but a lot of them won't work. Um, if you've got a set that was built for the long wave band, you've got to buy a new set. It's, it's like something else, isn't it? What's happening today? Okay, digital, yeah. All of a sudden, your analog set is just not going to work anymore. Um, this is the same thing. We're going down to medium wavelength. If you've got a long wave set, tough, you're out. Um, people actually advertise, bring your set in, we'll re rebuild it for you for, um, for the um, uh, medium wave length. Um, so that was going to begin on September the 1st. So the Australian Broadcasting Company opens with 6WF on 435 metres. In, in August uh, 30th, 1929, this was in the paper, the work of the Australian Broadcasting Company in connection with the new programmes and of the Commonwealth Government regarding the change of wavelength to 435 metres is practically complete and the dual change which, take, will, which takes place from broadcasting station 6WF on Sunday next should be made without any inconvenience to listeners. Except you might have to buy a new radio. <laughs> Disappointment. This is 1929, uh, September the 23rd. The changeover was the 1st of September. This is 23rd of September. Most people in Western Australia were prepared to give the local broadcasting station a chance to change over from 1250 to 435 metres in wavelength and to make due allowance for the sudden transfer of interest generally. Different people had different ideas of just how long such a changeover would take and how long it would be before the station was running normally. Everyone wished the station well and were prepared to accord it goodwill. Those who thought the changeover would take a few days and those who thought the business might take a couple of weeks have been both disappointed. One of the problems is, what they found was, they got the same sort of programs. There were still gramophone records and pianola rolls because it's, it's the same people in the same studio, basically. They haven't got any new programs yet. However, there's a backlash. So, as another listener, I wish to endorse every word said by licensee number so-and-so. The transmission from 6WF is absolutely worthless. Last night, having friends here, I tried to get the market reports, but it was hopeless trying to tune in. I got nothing and had to close down. As the music was all distorted, this could not be listened to, so there was no entertainment at all. On 12.50, and they also had 104 metres um, shortwave, I would have had the whole program and heard all the reports as they were the most consistent and clear transmissions in the Commonwealth. What is the object of this 435 metres transmission? Is it to kill wireless in Western Australia so the station can be closed down? October 1929. There's a complaint from a Batiphone owner. I would like to make a few statements regarding the reception of 6WF. We have had a four-valve Batiphone set since September 1928. Up to September 1st, 29, the reception was quite satisfactory in the daytime. Perth was certainly poor in the evenings, but as we could get splendid concert from the eastern states, it didn't matter. Since the alteration of the wavelength, we can get nothing in the daytime, and the eastern states' reception at night time is not as good as before, basically being blotted out by 6WF in the night time. So the reception was not as good. And the criticism continued. 1930 this is now. January 1930. Sir, in common with others, I growled at the transmission of, from 6WF when under the management of West Australian farmers, but after listening to the programs put to the air by the ABC, I am satisfied that we had nothing to growl about in comparison. Not impressed. The program was one of the best. The transmission one of the worst. Frequent returns to the studio because of noise and interference were necessary. I do not think my friends were impressed with wireless enough to buy a set the next day.
And worse off, I agree that after all the rash propaganda last year about the new era in broadcasting that would commence with the new Australian Broadcasting Company when it took over 6 RF, we find we are worse off than before. The traders are not happy. The present transmissions are spoiling business. This is 1930. As a member of a firm which specialises in radio gramophone combinations, in the country we get nothing but complaints and 90% of our business is done in the metropolitan area. Even there, there is a pronounced hum which spoils the value of the programs and makes demonstrations useless. Anything seems to be regarded as good enough for Western Australia by the authorities in the eastern states. And the sooner, the sooner modern equipment is provided, this is to, for 6WF, the sooner the wireless will progress here. It's still the same old transmitter at this stage. Well, things didn't work out. So in 1931, the government announces that they're going to set up the Australian Broadcasting Commission. It has been decided by the subcommittee of the Federal Cabinet, which is dealing with broadcasting, that the new control, Board of Control should be known as the Australian Broadcasting Commission and will be composed of five members representing the broadcasting interests and technicians. So this is 1931. The Australian Broadcasting Commission is opened 1st of July 1932, which is why we're here, because a few weeks ago it was the 80th anniversary. Yesterday, the Australian Broadcasting Company completed its contract, that's the company, uh, completed its contract to supply pro programs throughout the National Service, and to mark the completion of its work, a special farewell program was presented through 6WF last night. The opening of the program was a farewell address by the Chairman of Directors of the Australian Broadcasting Company, Mr Doyle, broadcast from station 2FC in Sydney and relayed through all A-class stations throughout Australia. So the Australian Broadcasting Commission is opened. <laughs> mm, yes, okay. This is 1933. It's been open now for uh, not quite a year. Even Wally Coxon complains. So the recent com com comments made by the direct, uh, Deputy Director of Posts and Telegraphs concerning the new transmitter of 6WF came as a surprise to many listeners. Ever since the wavelength of 6WF was reduced to 435 metres, listeners everywhere were told by the department and supported by the wireless traders that all their reception troubles would be over when the new station was erected and that their difficulties were due to the location of the transmitting station being in the city and the use of an obsolete plant. It has now been demonstrated that the department has made promises that it cannot fulfil. And, you know, that's pretty serious stuff from Wally Coxon. And outspoken criticism, it's a medium wave calamity. In the opinion of Mr W. E. Coxon, a well-known radio engineer in Perth, and former manager of 6WF, the fact that Australian A-class stations have been dragged down to the medium wave band is almost a calamity. June 1933. That's uh, um, not quite a year after the ABC Australian Broadcasting Commission was opened. But there were some glimmers, there were some glimmers that things were going to get better and people were latching on to a few little things. Can you make a suggestion? Can you guess what might have been something that changed people's opinions about the ABC? Pardon? B-class station. B-class station, yeah, could be, yes. But I'm just talking about the ABC only. Pardon? Relocating the transmitter. Side. Relocating the transmitter. But the, to the average person... Wouldn't know where it was, shouldn't No, what, for the average person, can you suggest what might have made people think, oh, this radio is not so bad. It could be good. Mm, yes, news is a good possibility, yes. No, it was cricket. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, and the relaying of a number of important events by 6WF, including the test cricket season, this is 1932, gave incentive to take out licences. And, sir, one sees very frequently adverse criticisms of programs, receptions, etc. But seldom does one see the Commission getting a pat on the back. I do not think sufficient praise can be afforded to the officials for the way they have treated the public during the visit of the English cricketers. What they advertised would have been a good service, but what they have fulfilled has been infinitely better. You know, 1933. People started to like this is a good idea. <coughs> There's a, there's a trap here mm -hmm. because
because this is when they were broadcasting it and they they did broadcast the cricket, yes, but they had to make make up the story inside the studio. Yes and, and no. There was a pencil <laughs> trick which was dropped on the tables to make it sound like a, a cricket yep. ball and bat heading. Look at the dates. 1932? Yeah, 1932 or what? No, 1934 it started. 6 uh, first broadcast from the Wacker in 1926. Oh, the, first, the first interstate cricket match that I can find from the Wacker was broadcast in 1928. The first international broadcast of cricket from the WACA was broadcast in 1929 and in 1930 6WF was relaying by short wave when they could cricket broadcast from the tests in England. So they were broadcasting cricket long before the synthetic broadcast came out. And even these dates predate the, what's, what, what I can find as the uh, first of the um, synthetic cricket matches. So. It is just amazing. I mean, Six WF was doing these things, and people did like it. And the other thing they liked was, can you guess? Football. Football. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, let's make that all sport goes in this category here, but something quite different. Horse racing is a good one. Yes, that probably was good too. However, in a totally different field, music. Better quality music was cropping up. It will be generally admitted that broadcasting has done much towards the encouragement of a better appreciation of music and the development of culture in the larger sense. This is 1932. Even the butcher's boy delivering the breakfast chops may be heard whistling an operatic air which possibly he would not have heard but for the advent of broadcasting. He may never have gone to the theatre. The gradual appreciation of music by listeners, however, is having a reflex action, for there is a growing body of listeners who have become critical in their judgment and are becoming insistent that the demands for the best which the art can give them. So music also, there is this feeling that we're getting something better here and we, and we want to keep it going good. So. 1932, September 1, the fact, that fact together with the increasing interest in the, of the listeners and their more critical outlook acting as a spur to the broadcasting authorities and the artists should ensure a bright future for listeners throughout the state. So there were some predictions that maybe this will, maybe this will succeed after all. Maybe wireless is something that's worth having. An addendum. Um, I saw this clipping in the paper, and it was a quote by Wally Coxon. With this system, this is 1932, with this system, it is forecast that transmitting sets using aerials less than a foot long could be carried about and operated by persons in the street. It would be possible for the solitary pedestrian to carry on a conversation with another person so equipped in another part of the city. What was he predicting? Mobile phones, yeah, he was predicting mobile phones, basically, yeah, um, in 1932. So, I mean, he was just so smart. And that's it. Thank you. So, thank you.